want to welcome everybody here. Uh, it's been a very interesting day for me today because I was filming uh, all afternoon long over in the, the bar portion of uh, this facility um, a reality show that's scripted involving the uh, Fremont Street Experience Canopy. And what they're doing is they're having little episodes, and the episode which involves me is that there was a contract out on my life. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how it ends up, but I will tell you why I'm sitting here today. And uh, if you're not smart enough to figure that one out, I, I can't help you. Um, and what we do here is we have a good time. I tell stories, tell stories about my life, tell stories about my law practice, about my family, whatever interests me. And, we recognize certain people in the community, and tonight I, I think um, I, I'm going to have a very unusual type presentation because I'm going to be talking, believe it or not, about five months in my life in 1978 as it related to my law practice. Five months. And as a result of um, the former special agent with the FBI, Joe Yablonski, passing away in the last two days, I brought back a lot of memories of the animus that existed in Las Vegas in 1978 and basically the years before that and a little bit after that when the quote supposed mob was deeply involved in Las Vegas and I was representing many of the folks who were involved as far as the government was concerned as reputed mobsters and um, I didn't realize until I, I was called yesterday by the Review Journal, which I hate. Anybody like to, does anybody like the Review Journal in this room? Does anybody wish Sheldon Adelson any good at all? I don't. I mean, I have no use for the gentleman. I mean, and I felt the same way when his staff called me up. They wanted me to make a comment about Joey Oblonsky, the former agent in charge of the FBI, passing away. And it came back to me about my feeling of a lot of different people, and that's the reason that I'm gonna be talking about this limited period of time in 1978, because I didn't realize until I was asked the question as to how personally I took my role, how personally I took the relationship, or lack thereof, that I had with my opposition, and I didn't realize how much, until I thought about it, my opposition disliked me. And that is basically the underlying current of my comments here tonight, because when Yablonski passed away and I got the phone call, the only thing I could think of is what my dear mother said, and that is, if you don't have something nice to say about somebody who passed away, don't say anything at all. And I had nothing nice to say about this man. And this is no secret, because those of us who have been here before know that I really had an intense dislike for him. I don't feel as though I'm violating any ethical or social mores as a result of saying that because this man came out to Las Vegas and instead of being deified as the newspaper did today in its articles, instead of that, he came here with a purpose. He was going to hurt Las Vegas. He was going to plant the American flag in the Nevada desert and he was going to take out and get, you've heard me say it before, a mobster from Chicago, which was one of my clients, Tony Spilagio, a federal judge, one of my clients, Harry Claiborne, and a white-haired senator who I did not represent, Paul Laxall. And he came out with that purpose, and the tactics that he used were low, they were unfair, and the court would consider them to be foul. And then when he was about to leave, he got exposed, and I love this when it happens to former people with the government or are holier than thou. He got exposed for receiving thousands and thousands of dollars from a bank, he said by mistake. <laughs> and until he was advised several years later that they found out about the mistake, did he make any effort to return the monies that uh, unrichly came to him. And his wife, and I usually don't pick on wives because I have one. <laughs> and I know that I could be punished if I pick on a wife. But every once in a while there are wives, ladies, who deserve to be picked on. And uh, his wife um, would go around to the various hotels and casinos and she would uh, sell them fish. 
and uh, uh, shrimps and squid and octopi and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was almost as though they were being extorted that if they were not going to have a problem with her husband, they would have to buy from her. And uh, it, the two of them were booted out of Las Vegas. They were really uh, left here under a very heavy cloud and to a point where the judges in this community, both Roger Foley as well as Harry Claiborne, disqualified themselves from hearing any of the cases involving that aspect of the government, the FBI, and what they were doing at the time because they felt that uh, they were crooks and they were swindlers and they were con men. And, it's so, and that's why I'm so happy because the country does recover. This is sort of what's happening today. Same kind of allegations, same kind of time taken up as far as the media is concerned and everything being designed to shape people's uh, opinions as to what's happening uh, with the government, what's happening in their community. It's just repeating itself and we survive what I'm going to tell you about now and we're going to survive what we're hearing about now. So, um, I'm going to take us back to 1978 and um, I'm going to make a little reference just to the dates here. On June the 14th of 1978, simultaneous raids took place throughout the city of Las Vegas. Uh, they raided uh, Tony Spilaggio, who was characterized as the mob's representative from Chicago, uh, keeping uh, the lid on for the casinos that had hidden ownership here and coming out here and uh, holding himself out as a thug and a hoodlum and the works. They searched him and they searched the Gold Rush, which was a jewelry store located on Sahara, very close to it, not next door to the Golden Steer. And um, there were some um, 83 search warrants, and they were based on, listen to this, they were based on wiretaps and bugs. Uh, wiretaps of conversations which were emanating from the Gold Rush and Spalacho's home, and bugs which were placed in the gold rush, you know how many? Amazing. 8,000 conversations were intercepted by the government and they went in with the search warrants and they took everything out, everything out of the stores, claiming that the, uh, the gold rush was a front uh, for uh, a, a theft operation, uh, a fencing operation, uh, stolen jewelry and the like. And um, it was um, uh, devastating because basically it caused the gold rush to be closed down. And um, it was very, very tense because Bellagio to that point in time had not been targeted ostensibly by the government. We knew that he was being followed. All of his associates were being followed. I was being followed. All the attorneys associated with me were being followed. It finally ended up with one of his associates, uh, a, a Hacienda a Bell, uh, captain uh, being stopped by Metro who brutally killed him and then claimed that they had a gun that he had a gun on himself and they could never find the gun and uh, nothing happened as a result of that other than one dead body out there but that's it was a lawless town and the lawbreakers at that time were as much the government as it was anybody who was a, a reputed mobster or a criminal and that took place and of course um, Spilaccio was very very upset uh, that his uh, privacy was invaded, uh, was invaded as a result of court-authorized electronic surveillance, and uh, uh, he took the position that there was no probable cause, that the search warrants were too broad, and he wanted me to sue to get all the property back. And um, uh, while this conversation was taking place in early June, um, he gave me a phone call down to my office, and my office was at 5... Uh, 30 South 4th Street, and he said, I want you to see this guy. I said, Tony, i got a lot on my mind. Um, I'm uh, trying to get this uh, search situation under control. He says, I want you to see this guy and see what the government's doing. I said, don't take it easy. I said, I'll see you later on this afternoon. Bring the fella down. And he brings down somebody who he says is a very close friend of his, a confidant, an associate, by the name of Rick Calise. And uh, Khalees uh, pulls out a copy of Time magazine, and apparently it was one that was prepared specially by the government, saying that uh, the FBI came to him and said that uh, he could provide valuable information against Bellagio, 
And uh, if they, he does that, then they'll give him a pass because they feel that he's been involved in the thefts. And if uh, they don't do that, then uh, he's on his own. And you know, Spalacho kills people left and right. And you're going to get killed because they've told Tony about you uh, that uh, they're interested in getting your testimony. So you're a dead man, so what choice do you have? I said, Tony, what, why did you bring this guy down to me? I said, I can't help him. I said, I'm your lawyer. I can't tell him not to cooperate with the FBI. If I tell him that, they'll have him for obstruction of justice. All I could do is I could refer him to a good lawyer. And I said, would you like that? And he said, yeah, he said, I'd love you to refer me to a good lawyer. I said, well, the truth of the matter is most of the lawyers here in town have relationships with Tony and his associates, and they're gonna say the same thing, that if they represent you, that there's a potential obstruction of justice. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to recommend three lawyers, all fine lawyers from California, who have wonderful reputations, and you go and you interview them, and if you wanna hire one of them, I can assure you they're gonna do the best job that a lawyer could do for somebody in your predicament being asked to be a witness for the FBI or not cooperating with him. He said, that's great, he left my office. Next day I get a phone call. It's from Jim Powers, who was the special agent of the FBI, and not a bad fella. And uh, not, not all of the agents are bad. And uh, uh, Jeff Anderson, who was the head of the Strike Force office. Now the Strike Force was a special group of lawyers who were sent out from Washington, D.C., uh, and they only did federal cases. Uh, they were with the uh, Justice Department uh, Division of uh, Criminal Prosecutions, and Anderson was a, a hard-nosed guy and not particularly likable guy, and he's sitting in Powers' office, and they call me on the phone. And they said, we want you to bring your client over to our office. I said, I have more than one client. Uh, who do you have in mind? They said, we want Spalatro. Uh, at, in our office. I said, I don't care what you want. Said, well, if you don't bring him in, we're gonna go get him. I said, then get him. If you have a warrant, get him. Uh, don't tell me what I'm supposed to do and to bring clients to your office. They said, well, we're not going to arrest him. Why don't you at least ask him whether he'll come to the office? So I said, I'll, I'll do one better than that. I'll tell him not to come to the office. <laughs> and I'll go to your office. So I went to the office. And this is what I was told. I was told that this fella, Bacon, or Calise, whatever his real name was Bacon, but he called himself Rick Calise, was an FBI agent. Now there's a big difference between being a cooperating witness, a confidential informant, but an agent is an agent. I mean, this is a sworn federal official who had gained the confidences of Tony Spalaccio, and um, he said that uh, Oscar Goodman talked to him, and Oscar Goodman was going to obstruct justice, and he has it on tape, because he was going to tell them what lawyer to use, and he was gonna tell the lawyer uh, how to represent them so he would protect Spalaggio. I said, that's what you called me over for? I said, I hope he has it on tape. They had a tape. I said, I hope he has it on tape, and. Um, I don't want to hear the tape because I know what I said. And I never said anything even like that. They said, we want you to know something. Now listen to this. This is unbelievable. We want you to know that this guy is an FBI agent. He's not some informant. He's an FBI agent. And if anything happens to him, we're going to hold you responsible. I said, I'm an insurer now of some stinking FBI agent who fucked me? <laughs> They said, you take it any way you want, but if anything happens to this guy, we're gonna hold you responsible. So I go to court, and I say that uh, I, I want the, uh, all the material that was taken from the gold rush sent back to uh, Mr. Spalaggio and the people who were running the gold rush. And uh, the government attorney says, we can't show you anything because uh, Rick Bacon, who Spalaggio knew as Calise, uh, is in fear of his life. He's going into hiding. He's hidden his family. 
And Spalaccio, we know, is going to have him killed. And he's scared to death, and we can't expose him. Well, with that, I had to go to the restroom. <laughs> and after I tinkled, I came out in the hallway, and who was going into the restroom? The scared to death FBI agent. I said, he's not hiding too far. He's right down the hall. I went back and told the judge, and the judge looked at the prosecutor, and he said, what's the story? Goodman tinkled, and he ran into the FBI agent. So the reason they did that is they filled the courtroom with reporters, and they wanted to get the word out that Tony Spalaccio was going to kill witnesses, so if you're going to be a witness against him, you may as well join the crowd. But it backfired on him. So that's what happened in June of 1978. Now a little bit later, I was trying a case in Salt Lake City involving Fat Sam Calabrese. And Fat Sam was charged with a knockoff of a lumber yard up in Kanab, Utah. And I'm trying the case up there in Salt Lake, and the case ends in a mistrial. And I said, this is the greatest, because Carolyn's father was being honored as the incoming president of the New York Medical Society, and I'm going to go back to New York, and I'm going to surprise her, and I'm going to attend the, 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 uh, the induction. And I got on a plane, and I flew back there, and I went to Macy's, and I got myself a beautiful tux, and I got myself those shiny shoes that people get, and had my uh, bow tie, and I walk into the hotel where the uh, party's taking place, and Carolyn's at the door. She says, you have to go home. I said, what do you mean I have to go home? She says, Saul Sags' son has been kidnapped, and they need you back in Las Vegas. Now, I had represented Saul Sag. Uh, he uh, uh, owned the carpet barn here. You may remember the carpet barn, where, is, where artistic art, iron works is. And uh, Saul had that uh, wonderful yeah. business, and his son was on uh, the uh, the tot lot over at the Temple Beth Shalom at 16th and Oki. And uh, on October the 28th of 1978, uh, his son was taken from the premises there, and uh, the only thing they got was a phone call saying that uh, a ransom was demanded, and after that, nothing was heard. Uh, I had represented Saul uh, because he and um, Richard Gort. Uh, um, uh, oh, Gordon. What's Gordon's name? Uh, Latoya's husband. What was his name? Carolyn? Oh. Yeah, are you awake? My wife fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said one thing about wives, and she fell asleep on me. Um, well, this uh, gentleman, Gordon, had at one point in uh, time. Jerry. No. Jack. Jack. Who said Jack? Oh, wonderful. Well, Jack Gordon, I love Jack because he was an impresario himself and always went around with a scarf around his neck and a big coat, a, a duster goat and everything. Uh, he had married Latoya, did you know that? Yeah. And uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, one of the great things I have in my collection of memorabilia is I have a picture of Latoya saying, uh, good luck, Oscar, uh, my husband's lawyer, signed Latoya Gordon. It's not worth two cents because of the signature. <laughs> Instead of Latoya Jackson, Latoya Gordon, but it, it doesn't matter. But uh, Jack and, and Saul supposedly go into another genius's office, Harry Reid. Um, he's a real genius, this guy. This is a real brave genius. Uh, he, um, but I can't say anything bad about him. He um, uh, was uh, the uh, chairman of the Gaming Commission, Nevada Gaming Commission, and apparently, according to him, uh, Gordon and Sag uh, offered him $12,000 to have a game that Gordon had invented, sort of a, a carnival type game to be placed at the casinos. Uh, and uh, uh, they say that uh, they offered him 12, I don't know, 12, I never heard of a $12,000 bribe, but uh, offered him, a, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't represent a guy who just gave a $12,000 bribe. A $12,000 bribe, and uh, uh, Harry, uh, uh, he screwed up. He locked the door. The FBI was on the other side. They were supposed to rush in when the offer was being made, but Harry locked the door the wrong way. That tells you a little bit about what happened back in Washington, I think. And, uh, uh, but he was able to overcome that, and uh, they arrested poor Saul and, and Gordon. So I had known Saul. And then when uh, little Carrie uh, was taken off the lot, Saul wanted me there. And it, it's interesting, with all of the, the infighting and the, the name-calling, a real tough battle that was taking place. I found myself in a situation uh, of the most unusual 
strange bedfellows in the world. They wanted me to stay at Saul's home because apparently uh, he had confidence that I would be able to make sure that the authorities were doing their job. And basically I slept in the same room with uh, John Bailey, who was an FBI agent, Jerry Doherty, an FBI agent, and Dave Dunn, who was with Metro. And uh, if you ever saw a more uh, discordant group of people uh, with uh, different interests, uh, sleeping together, uh, this, uh, uh, this would, uh, it was hard to, to overcome. And I stayed there, and after the second day, uh, Saul gets a phone call from a fellow by the name of Jerry Burgess. Jerry Burgess is the worst human being who ever lived. <laughs> no, uh, without equivocation. This is a guy without uh, a conscience. This is a fellow who uh, uh, violates women. Um, and has the mystical power over the women that they know that there are other women who are being violated the same way that they are. And he overcomes them with a physical assault and has them living in different apartments that they know about. And he says this. He says on the phone that he, listen to this, he was walking by Circus Circus and the public phone rang. <laughs> And he picked it up and answered it. And he was told that, tell Mr. Say that there's something very important that we'll be able to find in the chasm at Pecos and McLeod. There's a big chasm, almost like a dry river running through there. Walking by, hearing the phone ring, picking it up and being told, he's going to find something important. So the FBI said to me, uh, uh, they wanted to stay at the house. Would I go out with Bruce Bernie, who was the father-in-law of uh, Saig, Saig's uh, wife, Marilyn's um, father, and uh, explore what's at Pecos and McLeod. So we went out there, and I climbed down the, I was in better shape then than now, I climbed down the, the chasm and came up with a shoe and took the shoe back and they showed the shoe to the child's mother and the child's mother said that's the kind of shoe that Carrie had. Then they brought a, a dog in from uh, Pittsburgh and uh, dogs are amazing. Uh, they, once they smell something, it stays in their sensory powers uh, for up to six months, I understand. Uh, the dog alerted to the shoe when given other clothing of little Carrie and then the, uh, they took the dog and in an undercover capacity, basically, uh, went uh, and followed Burgess. And they followed him through Smith's Food Gang, where you know all the odors are uh, dramatic in the sense that they're very aromatic. Uh, the meat smells, uh, the, uh, the booze smells, the beer smells, the place smells. And uh, the dog uh, was able to uh, alert to Burgess and followed him through. And uh, they were absolutely certain that he was the guy. And all they wanted to do is one of two things, either find a child or in the Jewish religion, as I understand it, in order for there to be closure, uh, there has to be, uh, the soul has to go to, to heaven. And unless the body is found or recovered, uh, the soul can't go. I may have that wrong, but that was my understanding. And uh, they arrested Burgess, and it's neither here nor there, but Burgess, he was represented by a lawyer who was a coke addict, and uh, the jury felt sorry for him. He came to court just about every single day and didn't know where he was, and the jury let Burgess go. And uh, Burgess is still alive. He's still out there, and uh, overture versus overture has been made to get him to say what was happening as far as the child was concerned, and uh, he just uh, uh, won't crack and won't say anything about it, and the case remains. Unsolved. So that was happening, and um, that was a lot of pressure. Here I uh, had the Spalacho searches and seizures. I had to say kidnapping. And then uh, the government, um, the state government, uh, having waited around many, many years, finally decided to put Anthony Spalacho in 1998, 1978, into Nevada's Black Book. Now, the Black Book is a list of excluded persons, which precludes somebody from going onto a licensed gaming property, whether it's 
uh, where the gambling is taking place or just the, the periphery or the parameter of the property, like at uh, Caesars, or you can't uh, go to uh, see a, a tennis match there. Or, or you, you can't, uh, I, I got the law changed a little bit. He, uh, I always tell the story, he wasn't able to, to urinate. Uh, for some reason, I have urination on my mind. <laughs> but it's not tinkling. He couldn't tinkle uh, if he drove from here to uh, Reno because uh, all of the little uh, stores had uh, slot machines. So he wasn't allowed in, but I was able to get that out of the way. But they decided to do this in 1978. Listen to this. When I had all this on my mind, and uh, boom, they didn't decide, uh, they didn't have the hearing until 1983. Figure that. Uh, you don't think they had a plan? And I understand from a very reliable source, a Supreme Court justice at the time, that the FBI went to them in 1983 and said, you better keep Spalaccio out of these casinos or else we're coming after you. And that's the kind of attitude that was being taken here, and that's what was happening during that period of time. Then, almost the next day, Harry Reid orders that uh, Frank Rosenthal, who was... Um, uh, portrayed by De Niro in the movie Casino, come forward for licensing, lists a, uh, a dual hearing, never in the history of Nevada, of a dual hearing between the Gaming Control Board and the Gaming Commission to decide this, and sets it, I'm not sure, I think for Saturday, because I was busy in court all the rest of the time, and I was on the verge of having a, a, a breakdown because of all these pressures on me. I'd never had so much happening at one time of import to my clients and uh, I called up Reed and I said, Harry, could you give me two weeks so I could get myself calmed down and prepared and we'll have a hearing? He said, no. Well, and somebody else called on my behalf and uh, they told her no. And uh, no one is going to know who her was. Uh, and, uh, um, Harry wants to know why I don't like him. Uh, but uh, we had the hearing, and if you recall the movie Casino and the scene where after they uh, say he goes into, uh, uh, that he's barred from uh, working in an executive capacity, uh, they, uh, uh, Rosenthal went nuts. He got in the hallway and he blasted Reed, and everything he said was true. He was told by Reed that he was going to get a fair hearing, and he didn't get a fair hearing at all. And... Um, it stunk, and they put him uh, in a position, I was lucky, I was able to get him back to work because it was a de facto uh, taking of his work card without due process when they would not license him as a key employee, but ultimately they put him in the book, but it was that kind of pressure that was taking place. And then we go to uh, uh, the return of the property. I finally got a hearing to get the property back uh, from the 84 search warrants. And Judge Foley disqualified himself because uh, the government had put up a picture uh, in the grand jury room of Judge Foley and uh, other of my clients, and me too, uh, which uh, ridiculed us, uh, basically said we're organized crime, we're crooks, and we're no good. And it had an intimidating effect on those people who were going into the grand jury. And Foley, this is the first time in the history of the world, and never happened since then, gave me as a civilian an order uh, to have that removed uh, by the marshals. Uh, ordinarily, government has to uh, file a motion like that. I filed it, he granted it, and then he disqualified himself. He said, I can't stand these people. I wish they never came to town. Judge Cl Claiborne called them crooks, uh, and uh, he was disqualified. So they sent the case to Warren Ferguson, who was an old-time United States District Court judge in Los Angeles, and Ferguson came up here, and he heard the evidence, he heard the case, and you know what he said? when he suppressed uh, all the evidence from being used and ordered that it comes back, he said, and I'll never forget this, this is what the Revolutionary War was fought for. So something like this would never take place again. So some 200 years later, it took place again, and he threw it out, and that was the end of it. And I was hoping by that time that 1978 would be over. But 1978 continued. And I got a phone call from a fellow that I had met by the name of Lee Shagra. Lee Shagra was a number one graduate out of the University of Texas Austin Law School. He was a character. I had seen him one time at the Kentucky Derby 
He was in the Colonel Wynn room. Uh, he's the guy who went up to the cashier and he said, I want number eight. And the cashier, the minimum bet was 50 bucks. And the cashier punched it and he said, no, keep your hand on it. Uh, and he went, choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo. He, he, made, he made the dog into a favorite because of what, uh, what he bet on him. And we had a nice conversation. He says, I may need you someday uh, because uh, I'm down there in Texas and there's a judge there by the name of John Wood Jr. And he takes all of my cases, he creates uh, with the government prosecutor uh, the jurisdiction, uh, the venue for the case. If a plane is flying over uh, Midland, we'll take the case, even though nothing took place in Midland other than a plane flying over. And this judge rules against me every time. He sends my clients to prison with a maximum every time. And he's killing my practice. And it's a violation not only of my civil rights, but the civil rights of my clients because they're not getting a fair shake. That's not the way the system's supposed to go. And I may give you a call. I get a call from him. I want you to get together with him and to represent him in a civil rights action against the judge. And I told him, I'm, I'll seriously think about it. I really don't do that kind of work, but um, I, I understand what he's going through. And then uh, the prosecutor who was prosecuting all these cases and working very closely with Judge Wood, uh, he's down there in Texas. Uh, right around Christmas time, and uh, uh, 19 bullets are fired into his car with a machine gun, and then none of them hit him, uh, but uh, uh, he says he's scared. I don't know why a guy would be scared of 19 bullets. <laughs> uh, and um, it became very, very tense down there. And I called Lee up and I said, I, I, I will represent you because I know what kind of pressure you're under. And then two days before Christmas of 1978, Lee, who had the most sophisticated, electronically sound, law office. He couldn't do anything without pushing a button, having a code. It's like doing business with William Hill. Uh, he, he, uh, and they make a change, change the code all the time. I mean, you, you don't even know what you're doing. But uh, the two, two guys came into, uh, and it was nothing more than wanting to rob them. Uh, they came, they were over at the uh, military base close by El Paso, and uh, they shot him, uh, stuck uh, cocaine in his mouth, and uh, unfortunately, the bullet just nicked his aorta, and he bled to death. Well, it's a very small world, because they were going to start uh, a grand jury proceeding as to uh, what caused this. Johnny Quinn, who was one of the uh, 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 managers of the Race and Sports Book in this very hotel, had a relative who was a suspect. They called him the missing cowboy. And he asked me to represent him, so I went down to represent him, and when we got there, Prosecutor said, no, your client is not a suspect anymore. And then a fella who uh, was there uh, waiting, he said, uh, you're the lawyer from Vegas. I said, right. He said, well, my name's Jimmy Shagrin, and uh, I may need you. And he did need me. Um, and I did represent him, and that's for another day, another story. But I just wanted you to know that's what happened during five months of 1978, and I'm still married. <laughs> that's it, folks. Well, Mr. Jostle looking at his watch, so I, I figured I'd have to cut it short. Now, what we do at the end here, I open it up for questions from anybody. It doesn't have to be about anything that I talked about. If you have something on your mind, feel free to uh, ask me, and I'm happy to answer them as honestly as I know how. I have a question. Who said that? Me. I'm not interested in hearing from you. All right. Thank you so much. I voted for you. Oh, okay. Uh, early and often, I hope. Okay. Just that I think my wife and myself uh, were invited to his uh, mother's birthday party, right, sweetheart? I'm sorry. Oh, she doesn't listen to me. It's unbelievable. <laughs> doesn't listen to me at home. Doesn't listen to me any here. I'll tell you the story when my wife's not here. I don't want her to hear the damn story. <laughs> yes. I would like a standing ovation for Carolyn for her struggles and success. Well, it's all success now. Thank you. you did it, did you? <laughs> she hasn't been nice to me. Yes. <laughs> I've been to a couple of your talks. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, I love to do it because it gets me thinking about my life. And um, to be honest, uh, I've been the luckiest guy who ever lived. I've got a um, great family. Um, I had a great profession. Love being the mayor. I'm going to tell some mayor stories sometime and 
I'll see you, I'll show you some real corruption. I'll, 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 I'll tell you stories about politicians that make my clients look like angels. When you talk about your memorabilia that you kept, I used to work for an attorney in the 80s and he had a letter on his wall that said, the F this will confirm that the FBI has not wiretapped your office. Is there any equivalent thing that you have received that you've framed and said, wow? No, because they wiretapped my office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they, they've done everything. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I've heard myself on As a matter of fact, one tape that I heard myself on was with Anthony Sevilla, who was the head of the outfit in Kansas City. And um, uh, they, they wiretapped us. And he had called up and he wanted... My opinion of whether Frank Rosenthal, the De Niro character, uh, was a rat or was he crazy? And uh, I'm trying a case in Kansas City, and there's an FBI agent by the name of Gary Hart who's on the stand. They always, they always personalize it when I'm doing my cross examination. Well, you know, Mr. Goodman. Well, you know, Mr. Goodman. Well, you know, Mr. Goodman, that uh, that was a uh, potential death warrant for Rosenthal if you said he was a rat. Uh, you would have ordered his death, and uh, if you said he was crazy, uh, uh, he would live. I said, I was responsible that Frank Rosenthal lives or dies. He says, absolutely. I mean, these guys are nuts. They are really nuts. And then you get Yablonsky. Oh, poor Joe. Um, will you lead a prayer for Joe, Joe? You may. Uh, I can't help myself. I really dislike this guy. I know you're not supposed to say bad things about you know, dead people, but uh, I, I, there's no remorse. I, I don't, I, I, no. this guy used to go on television and say, I'm not a lawyer, I, I'm not a lawyer, I work my tushy off, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. And he says, he's not a lawyer, he's a consigliere. He's, oh yeah, oh that's on TV. You saw it the other night, uh, if you you watch George Knapp, he, he says it right on TV, where, George Knapp's here? <laughs> but, uh, Wait, wait, I think the mayor's whispering. I asked, I asked her a question. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. I asked her how old you are in that picture. I know, I saw that picture. Yeah, I used to be young. <laughs> but I am in very good shape. And my, my mind is maybe the greatest mind I, I've ever come into contact with. I, I, I do not forget anything. I, it's like a disease. It's uh, like, uh, uh, who was uh, in one of the old Dachi books? One of the characters, his name I think is Dexter or something, uh, he has a mind, and there's a disease, but it's a good disease, uh, where uh, you hear something and you never can forget it. That's my mind, and I attribute it to the gin. I, 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 I please, uh, I please tell people at Glazer Southern Wine that uh, my health uh, is in their hands. Because the more Bombay Sapphire I drink, the, the smarter I become. I, 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 Wait, I think a young lady has a question, and then, and then we'll have a yours, okay? Is that all right? Of course. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, amazing. Um, what would you say is your toughest case, which you are most proud of, and why? Well, there are three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's very tough to say, because one of these days, I told Jonathan Jossel I, I was going to do it tonight, but I think we're going to save it for the opening season for our next series, was representing an oral surgeon. It's funny, with all the supposed mobsters, with the underbosses and the, uh, the capos and all that stuff that uh, I was accused of doing, uh, the, uh, the toughest case was representing an oral surgeon in Carson City who was charged with sexually molesting seven patients while they were under the influence of an anesthetic cocktail. And uh, each one of the patients had somebody waiting in the reception area to drive them home because they had been the surgery or whatever procedure they went through. They were woozy and they wouldn't be able to drive themselves. And then uh, uh, after the indictment was returned, three other patients came forward and three other people who were waiting to take them home were ready to testify under what's called 404B, which is prior similar acts and uh, had the prosecutor knew what they were doing, uh, it may not have had the result that it had. And um, uh, a very bad judge, very mean judge, a very incompetent prosecutor. Sometimes you want a good prosecutor because you're able to 
anticipate what they're going to do, but this was a lazy bum up there. Uh, but I got I, his, uh, his staff um, all testified against him. They said at 5 o'clock he told them to go home with the patient in the chair and turn up the music, turn down the lights, and lock the door. So it looked like it was a tough case. Um, and the judge wanted to give my client 15,000 years. But um, that, that was probably the toughest case, believe it or not. People say the Shagger case, the killing of the federal judge, was the trial of the century. It was impossible to win, but that was a great win. Yeah. Uh, that was a great win. And uh, I, I, I can go through a list of them, but every case to the client is the most important case. That's the lesson I learned. So uh, be it a, you know, a stolen car case to the client, it's the most important thing in the world because they can go to prison for that. And I get a kick out of the reporters who never talk about prison. They always talk about jail. No one's going to jail. They go to prison. <laughs> jail, jail is if they, you know, you get stopped on the way home. You've been drinking. They take you down to the jail. You go to prison, it ain't fun. Uh, I don't care. There's no such thing as a nice prison. Uh, and, and the camps, just remember this, because Harry Claiborne told me this. He says, he, when they send you to a prison camp, which everybody says, oh, he's just going to camp. We'll be able to play tennis. Just going to camp. We'll be able to play golf. The matter is, uh, everybody who's in that camp may go in at a lower level, but the mean people, when they're coming out after doing 20 years, they have to go through that camp on their way out. And uh, they don't like a lot of people, and uh, what happens is not fun. So I don't know why you asked me the question, the stupid question. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, it's, uh, the mom's always been known for having its code and rules and sort of things. And when Spalaccio started having an affair with Rosenthal's wife, how was that perceived, and what can you elaborate on that? I'll tell you this. It really is incredible. Uh, you're not going to believe me. and Everything I said tonight is the truth. I had no idea it was taking place. In large part, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew what I was doing as a lawyer. Uh, Oscar, what's the question? The question is, uh, how did the mob take uh, uh, it when uh, they found out that Spalaccio was having an affair with Jerry Rosenthal? I, I didn't know they were having an affair. I still, to this day, don't know they were having an affair. I didn't find out they allegedly were having an affair until I saw the movie Casino. <laughs> and I wish I had seen the movie Casino earlier because I would have charged a lot more. <laughs> had I seen the movie Casino uh, early on, I don't... I'd own the Union, I'd, I'd own the Plaza Hotel. <laughs> I would own the Plaza Hotel. I would own planes, I would own boats, I'd own islands. I had no idea what I was doing. I was representing guys with the Lucchese crime family before a judge at the same time I'm representing guys from the Gabino, Gabino crime family who were mortal enemies, and I had no idea. I mean, I'm representing them as clients, not that they're members of some crime family. So I'm sorry that I didn't see Casino sooner. Yes, sir. Do you still practice? I have my license, but I have a, a son who's a very good lawyer, and I wasn't about to get in his way. And then I have another son who's a justice of the peace, and uh, I wasn't about to get in his way when he was practicing. So I let the boys do what they do. They do it great, and I'm very happy doing nothing. My wife says, you know, you have a great mind, Oscar. Um, you represented all these guys for 35 years. You used your mind. You went to court. You beat people up. It was terrific, and then you became the mayor, and for 12 years you tried to redefine the city and redevelop the city. And she says, now, all you do is go around with showgirls and drink booze. I said, I, said, I am the smartest guy I know. Okay, yeah. Is there a hand up there, or is that, uh, yes, are you turning off the light? What are you doing? Oscar, one, one question. Again, thank you again for everything you've done, but one, one thing that we've seen, the Stardust is gone, the Sahara is gone, the Riviera is gone, you know, the last bastion of old Vegas is Binion, the Plaza, El Cortez. Do you think going forward, and I, I know we're changing gears here, but do you think Vegas is going to look back at old Vegas and regret what's happened with the progression of modern Vegas? Well, did you hear it? You didn't hear it? Uh, I, I think uh, the question was with the uh, the advent of the old hotels passing, like uh, the Stardust and the Riviera, the Sands and the like. Uh, in the future, uh, do I think that uh, the new Vegas is going to do what? 
we're going to look back when we're driving. Uh, yeah, I think we're going, yeah. The truth, and I try to tell the truth, I think that the people who are in office to a person, who were in office, you are in office, to the people who were in office at the time that uh, these uh, casinos decided that they want to go to other places like Atlantic City and then to uh, the riverboats and then to the Indian reservations, and then to Macau, and then to Japan. Um, look at us, I really mean this, as a throwaway. I don't think they could care less about uh, what's happening here in Las Vegas because on the bottom line, we don't even uh, show up compared to what they're making in these other places. I had a friend tell me that he was down at one of these Indian reservations in a very poor part of uh, Southern California. And um, uh, it was over uh, the weekend, and he said that the, they were standing three deep in line. They didn't have anything other than slot machines and some restaurants, and the people couldn't wait to throw their money away. I think that unless Las Vegas figures out a way to be able to compete with that, I think we will be an afterthought. I really believe that, and I think, uh, and uh, you'll disagree with me, and particularly in this day and age, that there's nothing wrong with legalized prostitution. And I think that we should advertise it. I don't think there's, a, and for years, uh, we fought against the marijuana, and now it's being accepted. I think we have to make it very easy for people to enjoy themselves and come to Las Vegas, and to give our customers something they can't get anyplace else. And unless we do that, I think that uh, Las Vegas' future is not gonna be as rosy uh, for my children and my grandchildren as it has been for my wife and myself. Now, if uh, I'm quoted from saying that, I hope I am. And the people who are in positions of putting money in their pocket and taking care of their taxpayers and moving to Santa Monica and to Laguna Beach and living there in Del Mar instead of here and being part of this community, they could always jump to the line.